Today we're going to be looking at a very heavily requested Kyle Hill video. We're going to be looking at Three Mile Island, what really happened. For those of you who don't know me, I'm Tyler Fulce. I'm a nuclear engineer with a little over 10 years of experience in the commercial nuclear power industry. From engineering to operations to emergency response. I don't claim to know everything there is nuclear, but I can certainly share some knowledge. And the plant that I worked at was a Westinghouse four-loop pressurized water reactor. Think of it as a more modern version of the Three Mile Island reactor. As part of our training, we studied this accident extensively and regularly talked about it. This should be interesting. For all the technicality that goes into splitting the atom, a nuclear power plant is surprisingly simple. Rods of fuel are brought close enough together to cause sustained chain reactions, which generate a lot of heat. That heat is exchanged with water running in a separated loop and turns into steam. That steam just is boiler. used to spin turbines That's it. and that makes electricity. The steam is then cooled by towers and condensed to re-enter the system. And all along the way, various systems, valves, and pressurizers keep the system running smoothly. The most important part of a nuclear power plant is the core, where f One thing about this model is, like the one I worked at, Sometimes you don't even need cooling towers. It was just a really big reservoir, so it can be even simpler. Cool, typically uranium, is kept at the desired water heating temperature by control rods, which can be inserted into the core at will to almost instantly soak up the neutrons, continuing chain reactions, and shut the core down. Takes about two seconds. It's a design that, despite what politicians may say, is impossible to turn into an atomic weapon. That being said, a reactor core without an ability to cool itself truly impossible the enrichment is way too small there is simply not enough energy in that system to create a nuclear bomb give you a sense nuclear power plants enrichment about three to five percent of uranium 235 versus uranium 238 235 being the one that you get all the fissions from bombs upwards of 90 percent you can't get there it's impossible can be extremely dangerous. If cooling water were at any time to boil away, even a recently shut down core will start heating back up. At 2,200 degrees Fahrenheit, superheated water reacts with material in the fuel rods to produce hydrogen, an explosive gas. Yep. And at 5,200 degrees Fahrenheit, the fuel itself melts, releasing radioactive materials into the system's water and or eating through the reactor shielding to produce a flow of unstoppable corium, arguably. Those are the numbers. Those are, wow, that's, that's right out of the emergency operating procedure user guide. Those exact temperatures. Had to memorize them. Now, corium isn't unstoppable. It, it could go through the reactor vessel and the reactor coolant system, but everything's gonna, gonna run out of energy. There's also the containment building as well, which wasn't breached in the case of this accident. The most dangerous substance on Earth. To protect against all of this, the fuel rods- Corium being the most dangerous substance on Earth. I'm not sure I buy that because it's actually less radioactive than just the melted fuel by itself. It's the melted fuel fusing with things. But I get what he says in that it can be a very dangerous scenario if the fuel melted and fused with things just by virtue of having melted fuel, but it's actually going to slow down because the, the remnants of the reactor vessel are going to slow down that heat reaction just because it's going to absorb some of the heat. So corium, while it comes from nuclear accidents, or by crazies who want to make it in a lab for studying, <laughs> it's actually, I would argue it's less dangerous than just melted fuel by itself, at least in terms of heat and in terms of radiation. Hold the fuel pellets are designed to withstand extreme temperatures, and the reactor vessel is a monolith of steel and concrete. So as far as the temperature, so those 2200 and 5200 degrees Fahrenheit, normally we are, as far as what interface is with the cladding, we measure it with uh, what's called core exit thermocouples, and that's about as close as you can put something where you measure temperature to the fuel, and that's on, typically on the order of 600 and something degrees Fahrenheit when you're at full power in the reactor. Three Mile Island's Unit 2 reactor was 40 feet of 8-inch thick steel inside of two concrete and steel shields 
a total thickness of 9 feet, all inside a containment building 193 feet high with reinforced concrete walls 4 feet thick. Nuclear power buildings are extremely robust, even under enemy fire. It's this design oh, that made wow. what happened at Three Mile Island an accident and not a disaster. 30 seconds after 4 a.m., 10 miles southeast of Harrisburg, Pennsylvania, the feed water pump system to the reactor core tripped, stopping the flow of water to the steam generators. Two seconds later, the interrupted flow of feed water caused the reactor coolant temperature to increase and the water to expand. The pilot-operated relief valve opened to release the pressure increase. Eight seconds. I've never heard it abbreviated that way. Um, at the plant I worked at, we called it the power operated relief valve. Later, the pressure was still building, and the reactor dropped all control rods automatically into the core. One second after that, nuclear fission in the core had stopped. At this point, the relief valve should have closed itself to return pressure to the system, but it was stuck open a condition yes. for which there was no indication among the control room's hundreds of lights and switches. There is now. That's... <laughs> that, was, that was rectified to uh, put in valve position of the, uh, the power-operated relief valve, or the PORV. And there's also addition... Now, there's additional indications the operators could have looked at that they had available at the time but they weren't trained for that scenario back then. Less than a minute into the emergency, operators in the control room noticed that the emergency feed water pumps had turned on. What the operators did not notice were the two lights that indicated no water was running through those pumps. One was covered by an old yellowing maintenance tag. No one knows why the second light was missed. Over the next two minutes, the secondary loop of the reactor would boil dry. There's even improvements now on how you can put your, how big you can make your tags when equipment is tagged out of service and how you position them on the control boards to avoid that part. This has been cross-section just about everywhere <laughs> and everywhere you can do it. And an entire agency was formed, the um, Institute of Nuclear Power Operations, this is an NGO, but it effectively acts as an additional regulator. At least it does now. Um, right after Three Mile Island, it was more of a consulting thing. But their standards are higher than that of the Nuclear Regulatory Commission to constantly improve how nuclear power plants do business. In fact, those are the inspections that the executives in charge of a nuclear plant are more concerned with just because they're that much harder and they're that much uh, stricter. Because not you're not actually graded just by how you can resist accidents. That's easy. You're graded by how you're doing relative to other nuclear power plants. So there's this competitiveness that power plants share with, with each other. The emergency core cooling system would kick in, attempting to flood the overheating core with 1,000 gallons of water per minute. However, assuming that the in fact blocked emergency pumps were already flowing and not wanting to fill the entire system with water, the operators in the control room turned off the emergency cooling system. This was based on a lot of training was done with people who were in the military in, in nuclear submarines. so take this power plant and scale it way smaller that it's a propulsion system for a submarine. And one of the things that was brought up in training was they were very concerned about an overpressurization event. And they were concerned they were going to take the reactor coolant system, water solid, basically fill it up all the way, with the emergency core cooling system to the point where they would shatter their reactor coolant system. That is what they were concerned about happening. But little did they know their, um, their indications were deceiving them and they were nowhere close to filling up the reactor coolant system with emergency core cooling. For the next two hours and 20 minutes, the relief valve would remain open. It had an indicator light only showing that a signal was sent to close it, not whether or not it was physically closed, allowing over a third of all the coolant water to escape the system, after which the core started to overheat. Yes, they 
They had a hole in their reactor coolant system that they didn't know about. And when you have a hole there, so they had a level gauge for, for their pressurizers. The pressurizer is the highest point in the reactor coolant system. They had a hole in it because it was being sucked out through the top. But what they didn't know was they had a steam void within the pressurizer. So their indicator says their pressurizer is almost full. So they're like, oh no, we got to turn off this emergency core cooling system. So you have basically vapor sandwiched between, you have vapor that's pushing water up to the top. So they think their level's full, but quite the opposite. Their core is losing water. An additional uh, monitoring system was installed in all reactors after that with heat sensors within the reactor vessel and within the pressurizer of all pressurized water reactors that could tell you whether or not there's water at each individual level as you move up both of those vessels. It was designed specifically to prevent this sort of accident from happening. Every um, graduating class or licensed operator training, um, the people that physically operate these nuclear reactors, and you get a license from the Nuclear Regulatory Commission. And on every test, you get the Three Mile Island scenario. And with modern technology, it's actually pretty easy. That, and it's been taught so heavily, everyone sees it coming. Same with Fukushima. They're given the Fukushima scenario, loss of all electrical power as well. You're not given the Chernobyl scenario because that is impossible. That reactor to be in that situation again. Just the physics is different. You're not going to have a prompt criticality type event because there's not enough energy in the system and there's enough energy sinks to take energy away from that system in the form of in the form of for one having simply having water as a coolant and a moderator nothing's going to drive power up too crazy had this single valve closed had anyone left the emergency cooling systems on quote the accident at three mile island would have remained little more than a minor inconvenience Another thing that I will add, so I mentioned about the uh, secondary system, the feed water. If someone had opened the block valves from the auxiliary feed water pumps, then they would have filled the steam generators and would have had a heat sink to cool the reactor with. So a lot of holes in that Swiss cheese lined up to cause this event. Was Three Mile Island, in fact, a normal accident? After Reactor 2 failed in 1979, it inspired sociologist Charles Perrow to develop his normal accident theory, which postulates that accidents like nuclear meltdowns are inevitable, the result of unanticipated interactions of multiple failures within a complex system. Given the innumerable variations that might cause a failure in a highly complicated system, a single stuck valve, a pump out of maintenance, a plant manager not having his coffee that morning, no. The idea is to have redundant, sis you have redundant systems in place so no single point failure causes anything. The, the pour of by itself did not cause the Three Mile Island accident. It was the pour of plus them terminating safety injection. By the way, um, safety injection with emergency core cooling system now has strict criteria on how to on conditions that must be met before you can terminate safety injection. And you don't terminate it all at once. You start turning off individual pumps and you monitor what happens. In addition to the feed water isolation valves, the tags sitting on the control room, all, it's all those things adding up. So there isn't one, there isn't one single thing that caused it. Yes, you had one root cause, but you had a bunch of contributing causes to it. Pero argued that Three Mile Island was normal in that it was unexpected, incomprehensible, uncontrollable, and unavoidable. None of those things, really. Unexpected might be the closest thing because operator training back then wasn't what it is now. But incomprehensible? You can pretty easily comprehend what's happening to your reactor reactor coolant system. They were just looking at the wrong at the wrong indications. As far as uncontrollable, they would have kept their emergency core cooling system running, would have been quite controlled and unavoidable, I already explained. So I don't agree with that. Normal accidents then were caused by the flap of a butterfly's wing, so to speak, by systems so complicated that even trivial or random events could lead to chaos. 
The I idea of a normal accident revolutionized the academic study of safety and risk. The pilot-operated relief valve, the single opening that ultimately led to a reactor meltdown, had failed 11 times before March 28, 1979. The company that made these reactors, Babcock & Wilcox, never told its customers. 18 months before the accident in Pennsylvania, a Babcock & Wilcox reactor yes. in Ohio failed in exactly the same way as Three Mile Island was about to do. And this is why INPO exists, because these sort of things, that's called operating experience is the term that is used by INPO. They would have shared it, and then they would have shared the knowledge, and then it would have went through operator training for everyone. It's not just, there's not just initial operating training and there you're done. There's requalification training. It happens every six weeks. You do drills in the scenario and it would cover, it often covers things that have happened at other sites that are very similar. So they would have done this scenario at Three Mile Island. They would have, if this would have happened today, they would have, okay, this happened at Davis Bessie. They would have designed an entire lesson plan around that event and then knowledge would be shared. They would ensure that this thing doesn't happen again, or at, or at the very least, the operators would see it coming. Except operators there caught their mistake quickly. A senior yeah. engineer at Babcock and Wilcox. And even especially if they catch the mistake quickly, you're going to want to share it because it's like there's some there's some good knowledge there. So even good, there are positive operator uh, operating experience events that share success stories of people catching things before they turned into anything significant. Wrote an internal memorandum that if the reactor there had been operating at full power, it was only operating at 7%, quote, it is quite possible, perhaps probable, that core uncovery and possible fuel damage would have occurred, yeah. end quote. But again, Babcock and Wilcox issued no new instructions to customers. That's changed too. Anything associated with vendors that have anything to do with nuclear power, they go through these requirements too. It's a federal requirement now. This memorandum, which quote, fell between the cracks, was written just 13 months before Three Mile Island had a meltdown. Then there was TMI's control room, which investigators found had key indicator lights on the backs of panels switches yes. out of calibration and tags covering warning panels and never fewer than 52 alarms blinking at all times now if you have any alarm blinking there is got a there is a compensatory and maintenance plan associated with with everything for be, for operating at power and for things for equipment that's out of service there's logbooks and compensatory actions that are taken in place to ensure it's properly taken care of. You hardly see any alarms in the control room when you're at 100% power. Shutdown is a different story, but that's because you're doing a lot of offline maintenance. This, this same risk doesn't exist when the reactor is offline. There's different types of risks of things that can happen to you while you're offline, but th this particular uh, loss of coolant accident is, isn't one of them. Over 100 alarms would sound when the reactor started to fail in Pennsylvania, and it was impossible to sort the critical ones from the usual. Yep. Finally, the valves that would fail at Three Mile were in disrepair. Reportedly, boron stalactites more than a foot long hung from these valves, and stalagmites were building up from the floor. What happened? So, uh, the boron. That's from boric acid, another form of reactivity control like the control rods. It's basically liquid control rods. However, if you have little tiny leaks from any system that interfaces with the reactor coolant system, it can form these uh, boron boogers, as plant operators call them. And there is an entire program now called the boric acid corrosion program with engineering oversight and maintenance crews that are designed to go after this particular type of corrosion. At Three Mile Island may have been a kind of normal accident, as Charles Perrow would later define it, but it was not unexpected. Two hours after the accident at Three Mile Island had started, low-level radiation alarms were blinking in the unoccupied containment building where the reactor was dying. 
A few minutes later, That's never investigations a good sign. show the fuel in the core was no longer covered by cooling water and would remain uncovered for a maximum of 38 minutes. Any unplanned radiation alarm going off in the reactor containment building, especially if it's located near the vessel, is a sign that you have a leak. Some of them are very sensitive, designed to detect um, very small leaks that are on the order of gallons per day. To give you a sense, this thing is heavily pressurized, well over 2,000 PSI, that a quarter inch sized little nick in the pipe is over 200 gallons per minute, just because of that pressure just shooting out there so fast. So there are some very sensitive radiation monitors designed to help you find leaks. At 6.22 AM, operators in the Unit 2 control room asked if anyone had closed the block valve a backup valve to be shut if the pilot operated relief valve failed. The response was, Pilot operated relief valve has thrown me off. <laughs> the block valve was then shut. The loss of, I believe that it's a real term, just not one that was used at my plant. <laughs> was stopped, but the accident continued. For some unexplained reason, according to the president's commission report, the emergency core cooling pumps weren't turned on for another hour. At 6.54, the reactor coolant pump was yeah. turned on, mm. then shut off again 19 minutes later due to heavy vibrations. Calculations would eventually show that with eight feet of the 12 foot tall core uncovered, temperatures inside would reach at least 4,000 degrees Fahrenheit, causing major damage to the fuel rods, fuel, and the reactor structure as it partially melted down. Several That's areas of the plant now reported high levels of radiation. At 7 a.m., Three Mile Island declared a site emergency, as the Corps now threatened, quote, an uncontrolled release of radioactivity to the immediate environment. That's another thing is emergency planning, which is different from emergency operating procedures. Now we're looking at getting involved with the uh, local authorities as well. Criteria has changed. The way it is for pressurized water reactors now is you have three fission product barriers. There's the reactor containment building, there's the reactor coolant system, and then there's a the little cladding that goes around the, the fuel itself. So one of the ways that events are classified is due to how many of these barriers are intact, how many are lost, and then how many that's a potential loss, which is we don't know because we kind of can't tell, but based on these other indications indicate that we may have lost this one. So there's classifications and more escalation criteria that could have been done before you've got to a, a site area emergency. So additional help and additional emergency response uh, resources, um, engineers, technicians, maintenance crews, um, operations staff, could have been brought in um, even after hours to to address this that wasn't quite as well coordinated back then. Shortly after Three Mile Island officially declared an emergency, rising radiation readings caused emergency workers to evacuate the on-site auxiliary building. Minutes later, a radiation detector at the top of the containment building read eight rems per hour. But because the detector was shielded by lead, that figure was actually a hundred times higher and closer to 800 rems per hour, a dose that would exceed the maximum yearly dose limit for civilians in less than half a second. Yeah, that's another thing. They didn't have nearly as many radiation monitors and you have them at like, you have your low, medium and high range monitors and calculations go into it. So, cause you're, you're gonna want them shielded just so you don't fry electronics, but it does, it's supposed to do a calculation to say what the dose really is if this is what you're reading behind a bunch of lead. <laughs> At the same time, plant operators finally turned on the emergency core cooling system, flooding the reactor with 1,000 gallons of water per minute. That is very small amount of flow. Granted, the reactor I worked at was bigger, but you can easily get it to 10 times that now. <laughs> but they mistakenly shut it off 18 minutes later. At 7.24 a.m., Three Mile Island declared a general emergency, a, quote, incident that has the potential for serious radiological consequences to the health That's and the highest of the level of classification. Public. During his deposition, 
Engineer William Dornsife would remember what he said at that moment. Quote, I said to myself, this is the biggie. The traffic yep. reporter at Harrisburg's WKBO radio station was using a CB radio to scan for police chatter. At 8 a.m., he heard something good. Police and firefighters were mobilizing near Middletown, the closest area to the nuclear power plant. WKBO's news director called the plant shortly thereafter, but he accidentally got his call routed directly to the control room and to one of the operators scrambling to bring the core back under control. Quote, I can't talk right now. We've got a problem, a man said. The man then denied there being any fire engines headed towards the plant and told the news director to call the local utility company. At 8.25 a.m., the public found out what was happening at Three Mile Island, not from the plant itself, not from public relations, not from any regulatory body, but from a top 40 music station. This is Mike Pintek in the KBO newsroom. Met this is so crazy. Officials had to shut down their Three Mile Island nuclear power station unit number two this morning after an accident occurred within the plant's turbine system. So began a media frenzy that made the Three Mile Island accident one of the most reported stories of the decade. I'm surprised they at least referenced that it was within the turbine system, not if they would have just said accident, they would have immediately jump to, oh, there's something wrong with the core, it's going to destroy us all. Nowadays, there is one person whose job is it to speak to the press. That is one person's designated emergency response job. What didn't help was the China Syndrome came out within a couple of weeks of the event, and they had got so many things wrong in that movie, like that nuclear fuel would melt all the way through Earth and emerge to China. China's not even the opposite side of anywhere in the U.S., and... Do I even really need to say that nuclear fuel can't cut through the Earth's core? What has to be one of the worst PR disasters of all time. In retrospect, it's not surprising that the memory of Three Mile Island is so negative and so inaccurate. While reactor operators were still trying to soothe the dying core, core manufacturer Babcock and Wilcox made the conscious decision not to comment on the incident even when company officials believed misinformation was being made available to the public, according to the president's commission. During press conferences, official sources of information appeared unprepared, confused, and many times contradictory. The Nuclear Regulatory Commission, now in contact with Three Mile, didn't provide enough technical experts for interview, and so local mm. and national reporters had extreme difficulty in interpreting the specifics of the event, the probability of a true disaster, and the releases of radiation and their possible health effects. What happens now is there is someone in the control room whose sole job is to be on the phone with the NRC and to provide them updates on the accident, how it's progressing, what is being done to mitigate it, and how they are protecting the health and safety of the public. That shouldn't happen again, but that position did not exist back then. In turn, a distorted and confusing picture was presented to the public. The power plant began discharging slightly radioactive cooling water that had been accumulating in their tanks, now close to overflowing, but without notifying any downstream communities or the press. The water was harmless. The lack of transparency was not. People saying the same things about the Fukushima liquid waste discharge, even though it was treated water. Friday morning would prove the most consequential for Three Mile Island's legacy. During normal operations, a reactor like Three Mile Island's generates radioactive gas, more specifically, the noble gases krypton and xenon. A supervisor monitoring the rising pressures from these gases made the decision to open the valves and transfer them to the decay tank. He knew that because of leaks in the system, this would release radioactive gas into the environment. He ordered the transfer anyway, without telling either the power utility yep. or other Three Mile Island officials. And one minute after 8 a.m., a helicopter reported a reading of 1,200 millirems per hour above the plant's vent stack. It was over an hour that before was a the mess. supervisor told anyone what he did. Reporters already knew that 1,200 millirems per hour was somewhere at the plant. The Met Ed official pictured here did not 
They asked him for clarification, whether the radiation was controlled, whether it was from the discharged water, whether it was on site or off. I hadn't heard the number 1200, he answered. I don't know why we need to tell you each and everything that we do specifically. End quote. That sentence marked the end. That right there, yeah, that's, uh, that is the opposite of how you win friends and influence people. ...of Met Ed's credibility with the media. Yeah. An advisory went out from the governor's office shortly thereafter, something that was, arguably, the most impactful thing that happened during the accident. All pregnant women and preschool children were encouraged to leave the area within a five-mile radius of the power plant until further notice. This is what's baffling. Now, this is part of what happens in a general emergency. That's when the protective action recommendations are issued by the nuclear plant, but to the local authorities to say, and that's when they say, they, they look at, they usually look at a map to see which way the wind's blowing, to see which areas are affected, and which zones. These are all pre planned zones um, by the city or the county or whoever the local authority is that these zones say, hey, winds, go, winds blowing this way, evacuate zones one through three, shelter in place zones four through five, and whichever it may be. So, yes, this right here is potentially the most dangerous aspect of the emergency response because you're telling people to evacuate from the scary thing that they don't know what it is, being a nuclear power plant, and this is where you can end up with some fatalities just based on people panicking and dying in car accidents. We've seen that with hurricane evacuations. So anytime you issue an evacuation order, you may end up killing someone. So evacuation isn't always the conservative action. It's a uh, it's something you have to weigh very carefully. President Jimmy Carter would arrive to see Three Mile Island in two days. Say what you will about Jimmy Carter. Thankfully, he actually had nuclear experience. He actually went to the same school I did, Georgia Tech, before he went to the Naval Academy. So he had a general he would have a general sense of what was going on, at least compared to your average head of state. Had it been any other president, Things could have potentially turned out even worse for the nuclear industry, but he would have a general sense of what happened. An expert sent by Jimmy Carter arrived at Three Mile Island. He soon learned that a bubble of approximately 1,000 cubic feet of gases had built up inside the reactor core. Superheated steam was reacting with the zirconium cladding of the uranium fuel rods and producing hydrogen a potentially explosive gas. Unable to see inside the reactor vessel or even enter its building, scientists from all over the country, from all sides of the problem, started calculating. Hydrogen is explosive, but only in the presence of oxygen and yes. some energetic ignition source. So the real question was whether or not there was also enough oxygen in the core to spontaneously combust with the hydrogen, a potential catastrophe if it ruptured the vessel and exposed fuel to the open air. Thankfully, the Three Mile Island reactor was rated to withstand the pressure of such a blast, but public relations was not. That is probably Three Mile Island in a nutshell. The reactor vessel, the containment building could withstand it, the public could not. Beautifully said. Throughout the day, calculations flew back and forth between scientists. There was enough oxygen then there wasn't. There were five days before there was enough gas in the These are all shots in the dark. Less than two. No definitive answer, no sigh of relief or brace for impact. Nowadays, there's containment building hydrogen monitoring systems that are put in place, as well as hydrogen recombiners that recombine it with the oxygen to uh, turn it back into water. There are even some systems, not at the plant I worked at, that are glorified spark plugs, because how do you prevent a big hydrogen explosion from happening? Set off some small ones that aren't gonna break anything. First notice to the public that some NRC officials feared the bubble might explode spontaneously. The night the public learned about the bubble and the uncertainty it pulsed with, all hell once again broke loose. Pressurized water reactors like those at Three Mile normally operated with free hydrogen molecules in the system. 
That way, if oxygen did start to build up to dangerous levels, it would react with the free hydrogen to form harmless water. It's also used for oxygen scavenging for corrosion control. Hydrazine will break down at the extreme temperatures that water is in. In this case, it's got to use straight up hydrogen. By eliminating the risk of an explosion. The infamous hydrogen bubble in Unit 2 could be doing the same thing, could be eating up any oxygen so as to make explosion impossible. Scientists just had to prove that. Thankfully, by 4 p.m., and with help from scientists all around the country, on-site engineers had proved it. The processes inside the reactor were still violent, but they were not explosively so. That's a hell of a day. You're the shift manager. This is your control room. And things have gotten so bad. And now the president is basically coming into your office. And your job is to explain to him how things got messed up and what you're going to do to fix it. And probably even some aspect of what are you going to do to ensure something, nothing like this ever happens again. Wouldn't want to be that guy. And this is days later, so it's not even the guy that the guys that were on shift that, call, that caused it necessarily would never be enough oxygen. A few hours later, readings would show that the bubble was getting smaller, not bigger. The accident was getting better, not worse. But the communication meltdown continued. Now reading from the report of the President's Commission on the Accident at Three Mile Island, quote, By late Sunday afternoon, NRC, which was responsible for the concern that the bubble might explode, knew there was no danger of a blast and that the bubble appeared to be diminishing. It was good news, but good news unshared with the public. Throughout yeah. Sunday, the NRC made no announcement that it had erred in its calculations or that no threat of an explosion existed. Governor Thornburg that's, was that's not horrible. told of the NRC miscalculation either, nor did the NRC reveal the bubble was disappearing that day, partially because NRC experts themselves were not absolutely certain." End quote. It's ironic to commit so hard to making a fool of yourself on April 1st. This whole time, throughout my career of studying this extensively, I never made that connection that this was April Fool's Day. Thanks, Kyle. I, I appreciate it. <laughs> I really do, buddy. <laughs> Almost all of the radioactivity released from the Three Mile Island accident was from the planned, controlled venting of the krypton and xenon gases on March 30th. The total was later established at at least two and a half million curies, a direct measure of radioactive decay. This amount was less than 1% of the radiation released by the Chernobyl disaster. And unlike other nuclear nightmares with fission products that linger in the environment for centuries and have an affinity for human bones, krypton and xenon is not absorbed by body tissue and is quickly right. eliminated if They're noble gas. ingested. They don't krypton react with 85 anything. has a half-life of 10 and a half years, xenon 5.3 days. If anyone downwind of Three Mile Island was to be exposed at ground level, as would be later calculated, the dose rate they'd receive would be well within the dose someone gets from natural sources over the course of a year. There's actually a unit, an isotope, uh, iodine-131, and that's because iodine is in the thyroid and that particular isotope is radioactive. It's also a common fission product, and that one is probably the most significant in that it can increase rates of uh, thyroid cancer just because of the way it's upped it, it's uptook. That's also why the emergency director can authorize issuing potassium iodine tablets. So you basically have, you put non-radioactive thyroid um, iodine in your thyroid to prevent absorption of the radioactive kind. And when doing off-site dose assessments, units are converted into dose equivalent iodine. So that's kind of your benchmark. That's your unit of measure so, um, of how you measure that off-site dose. Um, another analogy to that would be using Hiroshima as a unit of measure for how intense nuclear explosions are. So yeah, krypton and xenon, not as big of a deal. An internal dose is so much worse than external because it can damage more critical organs, and it's also harder to get out of you. The amount of radiation released by the Three Mile Island accident 
primarily by short-lived isotopes of krypton and xenon, delivered an average possible dose of 8 millirem to residents within 10 miles of the plant. 8 millirem is equivalent to the dose that you get from the minerals in the concrete of your home each year, a single chest x-ray, and about a third of what every human receives naturally from cosmic radiation annually. Read the thousands of pages of journals, reports, and studies on the subject, and the consensus clearly emerges from the randomness. There isn't a single peer-reviewed, non-anecdotal report of one significant public health effect after the Three Mile Island accident. Simply put, our collective memory that Three Mile Island was some kind of horror show of health effects was a false one. And I, st I still see that today. I still get see it as comments on some of my videos talking about how bad Three Mile Island was. And what's crazy is this, and this is 1979, and more recent accidents or reports from other industries are forgotten. It's just crazy. 320,000 are likely to die of cancer for reasons that have nothing to do with a power plant being there. I've seen this with the anything, it's like you're going to assume every cancer death is associated with the nuclear accident, where, yeah, that's a, that's a flawed assumption right there. Nearly a majority of people will develop cancer sometime in their lifetime. The average projected number of additional cancers added to this 325,000 from the specific amount of radiation released by Three Mile Island is 0 0.7. Not 0.7%, yeah. 0 0.7 cases. And this is an average, meaning that there is more than a 50% chance less than one person would develop a radiation-induced cancer. Or, in less mathematical terms, no one. The conspiracy theories and anecdotal evidence and anti-nuclear panic that Three Mile Island generated, and still generates, have likely done more to harm public health through stress than any radiation released in 1979. And stop the development of more nuclear power plants, which is going to lead to more people dying from coal, natural gas, other less safe forms of generating electricity as an alternative. This is just very sad. This is the real tragedy behind Three Mile Island. In the months following the accident, hundreds of thousands of people across the country would stage anti-nuclear protests. Famous actors and politicians would attend them. World actors that were in the China Syndrome movie that came out just before. Famous musicians would hold nightly no-nuke concerts at some of the world's biggest venues. And this is what's crazy. It's being melded with anti-nuclear weapons and anti-nuclear power just because a lot of people thought that was the same thing. Oh, this is madness. Who knows how different the industry would be today if a single valve 10 miles southeast of Harrisburg didn't fail. Or if President Jimmy Carter, who specialized in nuclear power in the Navy, there we go. had told the nation what he told his staff after visiting the plant that day, that he didn't think it was even a disaster. He thought it was minor. He reportedly refused to tell the public this at the time for fear of offending anti-nuclear Democrats. This was extremely well done. Probably one of the best Three Mile Island documentaries I've ever seen, and I've, I've seen a lot. I like how much it delved into the PR part of it, because that part I haven't really studied as much. It was more of the, the technical side of things. The fact that half this video have talked about that, I thought was wonderful. Kyle Hill did an amazing job with this. I don't think it's irreversible, though, in terms of public opinion of nuclear. I think people just need to be educated on how on how the stuff works how safe it is relative to other forms of energy how it plays a key role in driving human progress that's certainly one of the reasons why i even have a youtube channel is to help educate this was very well done i still have hope i i have hope for us thank you very much for watching i'll see you next time